every time I make a super strict plan, like this is what we're doing, this is where we're going, uh, life goes, oh, you're so cute. Yes, <laughs> always. Let me show you what we're actually going to do. Yes. <laughs> Hello, my friends. Welcome to It's All Magic. I am your guide, your host, and your friend, Devin Hine. And here, we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic. I believe that our very existence on Earth is nothing less than a miracle, and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too, will finally start to believe it really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another magical episode of It's All Magic. I am so, so, so excited to have you here today because we are speaking to a multi-talented, multi-passionate, multi-faceted healer woman. This woman facilitated a cacao ceremony for my friends and I a few weeks back in LA for one of my friend's bachelorette parties, and it was truly incredible. Before the ceremony started, we got into a conversation with Quinn about her life, her life story, her beliefs, the practices and modalities that she practices and preaches every day. And I was simply stated captivated by her. She is wise, she is playful, she's authentic, she's confident, she's just a lot of fun. And so I cannot wait to share this conversation with you today where we discussed a little bit about her story of having grown up in South Africa, playing amongst the trees barefoot and dreaming of one day being a ranger, exploring the nature and the animals of Africa. We talk about her journey as an eternal vagabond, moving from country to country, constantly following the messages and signs from her soul itself. We discuss some of her favorite healing modalities such as metamorphosis and somatic practices. We go into the human pin codes, which is a form of numerology that also incorporates the elements into it. And we end with the classic topic of psychedelics. So if any of those topics interest you, Definitely stay tuned because I have an incredible conversation with Quinn coming up in just a moment. Before we get into the conversation, though, I, of course, want to allow us to check in with ourselves by taking a couple deep breaths and asking a couple simple questions. So if you would like to close down your eyes here, I invite you to do so. I also invite you to place one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly. The breathing we'll do today is extremely simple. We're just going to take three breaths in through the nose and then out through the mouth, sighing out with each exhale. And if you've taken the option of closing your eyes today, I want you to then keep them closed after that third exhale for just a short check-in that I'll guide. So let's go ahead and just empty out from our previous breath here. Inhale through the nose. Open mouth, sigh it out. (sighs) Two more. Inhale through the nose. Open mouth, let it go. (sighs) And final one. Inhale through the nose. And let it all go. (sighs) Beautiful. Keeping the eyes closed if you chose that option. And just beginning to check in with yourself. 
checking in with your body, with your mind, with your spirit, and asking yourself the question, how am I doing today? How am I feeling? How am I moving? Am I moving slow and heavily today? Or am I fast, light on my feet? What's my energy like today? What's coming up for me when I ask these questions? And then coming to the second and final question of what do I need today? Now that I know how I'm doing, the energy I'm embodying, the way that I'm moving, what do I need? Do I need a little bit of rest today? A few more deep breaths? A long walk outside, getting some fresh air, perhaps some sunshine. A phone call with a loved one. Grabbing tea with a friend. A cuddle on the couch. A good cry. Some music. What do you need? And knowing that now that you are aware of how you're doing and what you need, you can actually take what you need whenever you want it, whenever you need it. You can honor yourself by asking these questions every day, at least once a day. How am I doing and what do I need? They're the most simple yet profound questions we can ever ask ourselves. Because when we take care of ourselves, we can better take care of the people, the community, and the world around us. It is not a selfish act to take care of yourself. It's actually the most selfless thing you can do. When our cups are not full, we can't fill anyone else's. So taking one last breath to seal in this knowledge of how you're doing and what you need. Inhale through the nose. And final exhale, sigh it out. (sighs) Gorgeous. Fluttering open your eyelids mm, to a world where you can actually honor yourself and your needs. Ah, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, I am definitely ready to head on into the conversation with Quinn Brown Huffman. It will not disappoint. Buckle your seatbelts, my friends. I will see you on the other side. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another magical episode of It's All Magic. Today, life is about to get even more magical because we are joined by Wonder Woman herself. This Wonder Woman is truly the walking embodiment of everything she practices and preaches from authenticity and healing to creativity and even joy and laughter and play. When I met her a few weeks back, it was actually at a cacao ceremony that she facilitated for my dear friends and I. It was for one of my friend's bachelorette parties, and it was truly magical beyond belief. When I met Quinn, her larger-than-life persona, her energy, her charisma just captivated me, and I couldn't wait to learn more about her and have her on the show. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to none other than Quinn Brown Huffman. Hi, Quinn. How you doing? (laughs) Oh, my word. (laughs) You have just made me feel so seen and I'm actually quite emotional. Wow. What an introduction. (laughs) That's amazing. All of the emotions are welcome here. So please bring them on in. Why do you think you're feeling that way today? I am so in such a transformative time at the moment. Mm. So I recently, my world got shaken up 
mm. um, in the most um, profound and devastating way. I lost my mother. And oh. whew, yeah, it's been such a time of transformation and uh, and all the ways that life comes in and affirms where I am and what I'm doing just hits me in that spot because she was that person. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. And I'm so sorry to hear that. I know no words will suffice. I can't even imagine the grief, the pain you're experiencing, but you should just know from someone who has not met your mother, but who has experienced you in your fullness, you are truly just the embodiment of strong womanhood. Like when I met you, it was that divine femininity of the mother archetype, but also you have that, that power, that resilience. I mean, you are amazing. And I have no doubt that it was your mother and watching everything she did that made you into the woman you are today. So let's dedicate this episode to her. This is in her honor for everything she did for you and for the rest of the world. <laughs> wow. <sighs> Beautiful, Amazing. Devin. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. Well, right. let's kick this off with <laughs> with a really beautiful, positive question, just to ease into the conversation. So I always like to start with the question Absolutely. of, for you, what makes life truly feel like magic? Ooh, that's nice. What makes life feel like, ma oh, I, one of my key practices was offered to me by my dad at a very young and uh, influential time. I was maybe, I was 16, 17. And whether it was the craziness of, of puberty, but he always reminded me to look up. Mm. And there's something about looking up and finding that breath. Then you notice almost you can see all the molecules working in your favor really the belief pours back into me that everything is rigged in my favor the roomy quote mm. my quote living life as if everything is rigged in your favor and it's my relationships to the natural world really um my i mean there's everything in life reminds me of magic i think every encounter with a person um yeah every time I look up <laughs> that is beautiful what I really love about that I actually heard recently I feel like this is so synchronistic but I heard on a podcast that when we look up something about the movement of our eyes moving up actually makes us more creative it's something about the way it connects both hemispheres of the brain so maybe you knew that or your dad did but I love that in the spiritual sense of looking up reminds you of what's all around you and what's possible. But then physiologically, it actually makes you more creative. It actually opens you to those possibilities. So sure I does. love that. I mean, it's like the activator for the pituitary and pineal gland. It just activates. So that makes so much sense. I didn't realize I didn't put it together yeah. the way you did. That's great. I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. So before we dive into, there's so much I want to get into with you. I want to talk more about your story, yeah. your journey, all of the practices, modalities you practice and preach. But let's start off with, can you just kind of introduce yourself, what you do? There are so many tools that you use. So even though I will attempt to explain them in my solo intro, I want to give you the stage for a second just to explain what do you do, Quinn? <laughs> you know what is so wonderful and funny? Um, my daughter, I put her to bed, Laura, and she uh -huh. loves questioning us about our lives, about who we are. She's just this wonderful, curious human that wants to figure it all out at the age of 10. So she goes, <laughs> Mom, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> what do I tell people? And so 
she really made me reflect how interesting mm. it is to try and explain what it is that I do. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> really, I, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, so I believe I am a form of a connector uh, and a holder of the um, the soul's journey. So when I sit with people, whether it was in performance, as a doula, as a mother, as a friend, as a sister, um, all the things, I forgot to put that down, um, all the things that I um, found myself in encountering life, it's really connecting us back into soul. Mm. And... I've, I, I'm like this cheerleader for soulfulness, for people to mm-hmm. really remember that we are here experiencing ourselves in life and that it all matters. And yet it's, it's just an experience and we're part of this whole, um, not to get too caught up in um, this one way of being. So what do I do? Mm-hmm. I run a shop called Provisions in Sunset Park of LA, and it's a place where I now invite people in to connect in ceremony. I really, my, the next invitation life has offered me is, um, and the call, and now I'm answering, is to really step into the importance of ceremony and ritual in our lives, Mm -hmm. this modern day times getting people to slow down and actually move forward every phase of the day, of the month, of the cycle, with intention and attention. So really that ceremony holds all of that to me. And then I start looking back at all the connecting points in my life and I see that it was always brought back with a sense of circling, ceremony, giving people space to hear themselves in a different way, calling souls Mm. forward. I don't know what you call that. I, I mean, I just kind of sucked <laughs> it up now as a, maybe a connector. <laughs> I love that. I yeah. I don't think we even need to boil it down into words. I think that's too modern of a concept. And I think the more that we can all embody our multifaceted selves and allow ourselves to change, evolve, wear as many hats, titles, and names as we want, the better society will be. So I, I absolutely love wearing many hats and I love that you do too. And I'll also say with ceremony, I, I love that there are modern people like yourself that are willing to facilitate that kind of intentional magic in a circle setting because we used to do that as humans. And as you said, we've gotten so far away from that. Our lives move so fast. We barely even take the time to sit down, even without a circle, just sit down by ourselves and tune in, ask ourselves what's going on, what we need. And even in the couple of hours that you facilitated for our cacao ceremony, I mean, it was beyond words like we laughed we cried we held each other we got kind of individual guidance from the card deck that you brought out so I don't even have words but thank you for doing what you do because it's definitely needed Mm, yes it was so juicy and divine oh yes I loved that moment with us together yeah me too really heartwarming and opening on I feel like the ripple of that was um that you all all of you carry such magic you do yeah you surrounded yourself with magical people yes Mm. I agree so something I want to dive into is your story because probably like yourself I, and like your daughter, I am fascinated by people, by their stories, by what makes them them. Why are they this way? And because I've heard you describe yourself as a performer and a storyteller, I was wondering if you could tell us the story of a young girl growing up in South Africa playing amongst the trees. Can you tell us a little bit about that little girl? What was she like? What was that upbringing like? 
So yes, I I was um, I definitely grew up in the I was a privileged South African, you know, and um, I had a beautiful family. I grew up with my grandmother in the house, who was her name's Quinta. So she, I mm. presence her because she is such a huge guide in my life, and um, as a young girl having her presence, she, she knew how to slow down. She was incredibly nurturing. Meals were always celebrated. Um, and I grew up with a beautiful garden and, and trees. And that was my playground. I would just sit amongst the trees. I love getting my hands dirty. I would create little worlds. I was always caught in my imagination and it's fascinating looking back at the stories I played out with my imagination and how it was, I almost intuitively plugged into other realms by if I, when I start looking back at, at the stories I told, because I didn't really have reference for what I was telling. Mm. But my culture as Afrikaans, South African, there was there's so much history in how um, our story played out that the stories I was telling as a child in the garden, playing with my dolls were little characters in my story. They were little sisters that I was saving from the rebels and the, you know, the people that killed my parents. Oh, it was all very dramatic. And I would have these little hideouts under the brush and all these stories. And so, and I mostly played by myself. I had one friend who would go there with me every once in a while. But mm -hmm. I think my stories and, and who I was at the time was quite intense. Uh, I lo Looking back, I realized that. And my best friends were the birds and the rocks and the shrubs and the flowers and just that way. So fast forward a little bit. My brother is about eight years younger than me. And he's a wonderful human being that came and just enriched all our lives and it activated my dad and we started going on safari. So we did every year, we would do a couple of weeks into Africa as a, a few families, two or three families in Land Rovers. You pack up everything. You pack up your water, your food, your, air, you know, gas, because mm. you're going into Africa. There's, you're not going to, it's not a gas station next to the road or, you know, wild camping, mm. wild. That was such another activator for me it was my happy place it was me and my tribe and my family was really my tribe they were my best friends and my reflection and because I was actually quite a lonely child mm -hmm. and so exploring Africa that way and sitting around campfires and being with my dad especially then he was he was such a adventure man he was um, his own kind of medicine man, quiet, mm -hmm. stoic, um, but yeah, very dependable, strong. He was my Superman. So I got to see Africa on a whole nother level. And that was um, a big influence on me. So when I then went on my own as an 18 year old, uh, that was a life-changing year for me in 1998. Mm -hmm. I just took the year and I traveled to Europe. And there's many stories there. But one of the things that stands out that's also was an activator was when I had to just answer the call of life that every time I make a super strict plan, like this is what we're doing, this is where we're going, uh, life goes, oh, you're so cute. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> always. Show you what we're actually going to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I got, I mean, it's a, such a beautiful long story and I actually wrote it down. So, but short, short version, I got stuck at the border. My visa was going to expire. Didn't realize it. So I got kind of pushed out of where I was going to go. And it was a night out on the streets of London with no place to stay and just many little mini adventures until... I just heard, go to Scotland, go to Scotland. Mm. I'm like, okay, fine. Got the bus ticket to Scotland and then just went to every place until I was done there. Went to stand at the bus stop, kind of picked out where I'm going next. And so I really started to follow soul and the mm. call to what's coming. It was a real personification and act, 
a point of activation because I got to live it. I got to feel it. And the magic of doing that was mm -hmm. forever will be how I remember. And then I step back into flow that way. Um, the encounters with people and the land. And mm -hmm. I call it picking up my bones, finding those bones that's mine, that, that makes up who I am. Um, fast forward another a moment into going back, trying to please people, you know, do what's right by my family, fight, go to get a degree, do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I went for an environmental management BSc science degree mm -hmm. at the University of Johannesburg. Okay. And oi, 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 not a good idea for me. <laughs> I, because it wasn't my call. It was, mm -hmm. I was trying to please somebody and make someone else, you know, be proud of me. But, you know, mm -hmm. my dad making sure I get a degree. Oh, that was a rough moment. I got, I really experienced deep and severe anxiety. Depression hit hard. Mm -hmm. I went quite dark, found the shadow mm -hmm. there. And literally one morning woke up. The sun beamed in and I realized this is all my choice. I get to say yes or no. And it's so simple. Like the most profound things are so simple, right? You, you mm -hmm. From a cognitive intellectual place, you go, yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -mm. Do you live it? Do you live the fact that every moment that we participate is a choice that we get to make? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a, a, a wonderful realization. And I got up and I said, oh, in that case, I'm changing to the humanities. Anthropology is what's calling me. And let's see where that takes me. Moments later, literally within three days at the place that I was working, they were doing pre-production for a show, a new show that was going on to national TV in South Africa. And the producer called me aside and said, come for an audition. This is not something I ever thought I would do. This has never crossed my mind as a possibility. And um, I just looked at him like he was, what is he even saying? What is an audition? Like I was that not in that world. Right. <laughs> I was going to be, you know, a game ranger or walking the planet, you know, bare feet. That, that was more where I was heading. But this was an opportunity. This was kind of intriguing. So um, my boss at the time took me and he said, here's the script. Let me teach you something. And then I went, then my journey started as a performer. Mm. I found my voice. I started understanding that, you know, people's stories, anthropology, there was a reason that intrigued me. And so I jumped into that. Wow. Uh, yeah. So looking back. I think back, I should stop for a moment because I'm just carrying yeah, on. There are so many things I want to say. First of all, beautiful storytelling. But <laughs> one question that I wanted to ask about the performance aspect. Looking back, of course, we always have 2020 vision when we're looking back at our lives. Why do you think that happened? Like, why did the universe conspire to get you to audition for this show? In what way was that part of your path? So looking back, it was because the show was the first story on our national television that really mirrored where we wanted to see our society going, where there was integration, mm. there was different races and cultures living amongst one another, coming back to that sort of harmony of biodiversity. So we were telling the story in that way. Mm. And what that did was we became a beloved show of South Africa that allowed us to have an end to communities where we could be of service because the reason it was it was soon after I got casted that I went why am I doing this like this is strange uh path for me I don't really and I sat with a beautiful teacher David Dennis and something in our conversation brought me to the realization that performing storytelling is a healing art mm -hmm. and the moment I heard and understood it as that that it would be of service to a community 
I was in, I was all in. And then our path took us into many different communities of South Africa where we could be of service to fundraising, to just allowing us into people's places and spaces where we could say, we see you and you know yeah. what? You're incredibly valuable to this world um, in communities where they did not feel seen or felt valuable or enough. So yeah. being part of a new sense of South Africa. As you ask this question, I remember as I'm traveling Europe as a very naive 18 year old, not really understanding even the dynamics of the politics in my country at that time. People mm -hmm. were questioning me harshly over there in Europe. And mm -hmm. all I, my phrase was over and over, it's a new South Africa. It's going to be different. Mandela is in and he is a visionary. It's a new South Africa. That was my mantra. Huh. So mm -hmm. anyway, there I was. Next moment I'm on the show and it's part of this, that story. That is so yeah. interesting. It's almost like you truly called that in for yourself by believing this is a new South Africa. You got to be part of that, that wave. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. For a moment That's there, that was very sweet. Yeah. Yes. And I also mm. completely agree with you that storytelling is a healing art. I myself come from kind of a family of storytellers. My dad uh, when his older brother had children, they always called my dad Uncle Brad the Storyteller because he could just weave these long, intricate stories and he's very emotional, so he pours his heart into it. And then my mom had this kind of transformational experience when he she was young. She was in school and they had an assembly, so the whole school was was invited and this storyteller performed. And she had a moment where she thought, that's an actual job to be a storyteller. And she was captivated by their performance. And so I feel like when you can tell a story properly, you can tug on someone's heartstrings. You can get directly into their mind through their heart. That's where change happens. There are times when I'll even listen to someone talking about a topic that I agree with, but because they don't kind of tell the story or package it in a way that will get to people, it almost sometimes aggravates me of like, oh, they're not, they're not telling the true essence of the story. They're actually going to turn people off from it. So all of that is to say, I agree with you. <laughs> Storytelling is healing indeed. And one other thing that I really wanted to touch on that I think makes you so unique, and I haven't met many people like you in terms of this, is all of your migrating, the fact that you allowed your soul, your intuition to guide you to different countries. And the reason I love that is because one of my favorite quotes in the world that I know you will also resonate with says, I often wonder why birds stay in the same place when they could go anywhere on earth? And then I ask myself the same question. <sighs> it's such a good quote. And that was one of the things when I met oh, you. Yes. When I met you, it instantly, I mean, gave me chills hearing about your, your moving, your living abroad because... In so many ways, I feel like that was probably a big part of your spiritual journey as well. Your story of finding yourself, your story of transformation. Is that true? I, it is. It is true. Yes. I, my, my dad was such an instigator of our travel and adventures. Mm. And like I said, short, so he took us many places. My first time to America was when I was 16, right before I actually met my now partner, Ryan. And, uh, yeah, that's a fun story too. <laughs> I'd love to hear it. And so when I came, <laughs> when I came to America as an adult, when I was actually grieving for my dad, I needed space because the show at that point had taken on another level and it was, it's hard to, um, you're, you yeah, just, there's not a lot of space. And I needed space. I was grieving hard and it was, um, it was tough. So I, my dad had always talked about San Francisco and that's 
I just went, I'm called there. I want to go to San Francisco. And so my journey was a little bit around, I went back to London and then to LA and then I drove up to San Francisco. And that is where Ryan lived. And so that call brought me to my life partner. Yeah. And and it is when you just follow that. I always speak of, of there's this aligned yes in your body and, and mind. There's this sense of a, what does yes feel like to us as, as individuals is different. Yeah. But figuring mm. out what your yes feels like is liberating. Mm. Because then you move without a doubt. You go, oh, that is a yes. I have, to, I, even when it's not in, it doesn't feel in harmony for those around you. When you move in harmony with yourself, it soon becomes what is the best thing for everyone around you. So the mm-hmm. ripple of staying in alignment with soul is, is only beneficial for the greater good. I've had to learn that as a big people pleaser. So that's why I speak into that. But yeah, following that, yes, your yes. Yeah, absolutely. So for people listening that want to learn to follow their yes and to make choices out of love rather than fear as you yourself had to learn. But let's say they don't really know what yes feels like. What are your tips or advice for someone just getting to learn what their intuition is, is saying to them? Mm. So my tip for that and how I learned it is really a kinesiology tip and really tuning into your physical body. Okay. So my practice, which is founded in metamorphosis is, mm-hmm. is really the through line and we'll get to that later, but it's really tuning into your physical body, into your heart space. So then you ask yourself the question, whatever it is, should I do this as this person is this food is this medication you ask yourself, is this where good for me? Is this what is needed for me? And you stand with your feet Mm -hmm. together and you really just find your center. When you ask that question, listen, is there a sense of lightness? Because the light sensation, the sense of almost floating forward towards it, the sensation of you can take a breath. There's like breath, there's space for it. There's Mm -hmm. lightness is your yes. Yeah. The moment you feel yourself sort of sinking into this like constricted space of your your chin drops down and you kind of feel the constriction in your jaw and there's a constr- there's a heaviness that lands on my shoulders. I mm. feel like I can't go nowhere. There's a heavy that's for me as a no. It's very subtle for m- most people. So mm-hmm. I'm a feeler. Uh, my body is very activated. Um, that's why I get all my information. So it's, even for me, I had to learn to listen to that. Yeah. I picked it up because it was loud for me. But when I work with people one-on-one, we do different things to just first get them into their bodies. And But one of the things is just like there's a little sway. There's a very subtle sway towards what is your yes. So I'll hold medicine to my heart. And I'll close my eyes. People think I'm crazy in the store. And then I'll just go, <laughs> is this for me? And if it's a yes, I I lean into it. If it's a no, I go nowhere. So <laughs> it is That's as magical amazing. and simple as that. <laughs> I love that. And I completely agree. I feel that way when I'm trying to discern between whether I'm letting my mind guide me or my my heart and my intuition. So even with you know, being a small business owner, which I know you can understand, whenever I start telling myself, oh, I really should do this, you know, whether it's I should post on social media more or I should have this big launch for this thing. If you if you start shooting on yourself, that usually comes from a place of the intellect, the thinking of what you believe you have to do. And I've started very slowly learning to do exactly what you're saying. I love that practice of just closing my eyes, even putting my hand on my heart, maybe the other on my belly and saying, but how does that feel? 
And anytime I start thinking of all the things I should do and I start feeling small and anxious, I know that's not it. That's not right for me. (laughs) So it really is, I mean, a transformational practice. It is. And it's, it's, it discerns you from, because it's, we got to be, because a lot of times people get confused between anxiety and excitement, nervousness, Mm -hmm. and they'll go, oh, I'm just feeling too many feelings. And, and then they bypass, they don't want to feel, there's a sense of uncomfortable discomfort. Now discomfort or a little nervous energy is activating. It's not necessarily me. No. So Mm -hmm. it's a deep listening exercise to the sense of light versus heavy Mm -hmm. it's love versus fear it's because this i mean for me this last move we made to america it took me a while to even uh, admit to the fact that it's really to myself even that it's really what i want yeah because it was a big decision for everyone around me to make this move and um, and I can, but for me, I've, I cannot deny when the yes is yes. It's like, I, I know the cost of not following that. I yeah. know the cost for me. And that is not, I can't go there ever. It's not good. It's just not good. Absolutely. <laughs> not pretty. Amen. Amen. And I feel like we all have We're to learn to that at some point yeah. in our journey. Yes. Absolutely. So something else that this is kind of segueing into you into, you mentioned the practice metamorphosis, which I am fascinated by on so many levels. And one kind of small personal fact, the reason why when you mentioned metamorphosis, I was like, whoa, is because a couple years ago, I actually had created and taught my own six week holistic wellness course. And it touched on everything from Uh, meditation, breath work. I talked about longevity and kind of the science around that. It was really holistic. It was amazing. And I called it chrysalis to catalyst. And all of the imagery about the course was this butterfly chrysalis and spreading its wings and flying. And so I feel deeply connected to that lingo. Even right now, I'm wearing butterfly earrings. So I feel that it's very aligned to talk about metamorphosis and the healing it creates. So because talking to you was the first time I heard about metamorphosis, do you mind just kind of going back to the basics? What is it? How is it created? What does it do? Mm. Yes. Okay. Oh, gosh, that is so fantastic. I knew you were a little (laughs) twin soul. Um, (laughs) The butterfly, yes. I was um, 20, 21 when my life really started um, giving, I was kind of in the rapids. Lots of Mm. things was happening that was very uh, shaky. I was a big car accident. My dad left. There was relationships, work stuff, blah, blah, blah. This was the Mm. time where I found metamorphosis. So I was Mm. in transformation, very ripe for it. And I was not really looking for myself. I was looking for my mother because she had through like adult onset trauma induced diabetes. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to find the solution here. And I was with my esthetician who was also diabetic. And she started telling me about metamorphosis. And I was like, okay, well, I need to learn about this. So Metamorphosis was founded by Roberts and John in the 50s in Australia. And he was a naturopathic doctor. He was he worked with the Bates Eye System. He worked with reflexology. And everything that he worked with was always treating symptoms. And he never got to he was he was really intrigued by why uh, the dis-ease in the world just continues. Like there's this huge amount of tension that just does not ease up as if we're just constantly soothing, but nothing seems to really get to the core to make a real change happen. And working with the Bates Eye System, he recognized these attitudes of the mind. There's this long vision and short vision. There's this afference and efference. And when he looked at reflexology and how it points to different parts of your body and organs and everything, 
he worked with the meridian lines of our spine from the pineal to the pituitary also. And he saw that that related to a timeline of preconception through birth. So at first he called it prenatal therapy. So it's a light touch somatic therapy is what I call it now because you're working with the body's intelligence. And I love everyone's waking up to soma and somatic and somatic breath Mm -hmm. and somatic this and somatic that. So I'm jumping on the bandwagon and I'm introducing it now so that people have some form of context because it is it is working with the body's wisdom the innate soul intelligence so i always paint the picture we're all born with a certain amount of of tension uh, because of how we were conceived the time the parents the part of the land that we conceived on all of those energetics and frequencies and vibrations karmic and genetic patterns form and that's our cellular memory so with Mm -hmm. the light touch and the intention and philosophy of metamorphosis and i love it all the science is starting to back us up with epigenetics and all the case studies and all the neuroplasticity it's like we're all starting to say the same thing so it's really exciting times i feel like robertson john was way ahead of his time and he just people were like what you know what (laughs) This is, we're in a linear space. What are you talking about, you know? Yes. So he was he was very much um, bringing that sort of Eastern and, and understanding of even a lot of different medicines, ancient medicines. And he was just trying to figure out a language for modern day. And here we are. I just know that the principle of it is is like so many things says the same thing inside out. So what is going on for you inside your cellular vibration and dis-ease will reflect. That is what you will see and, and vibrate in the world. Is it, the, and opposite is also true. So how you view your circumstance will ultimately um, influence how you emote and take action and how it transforms your cells. So the light touch is working with the vagus nerve. It's soothing the vagus nerve. It's soothing and the parasympathetic nervous system. It's intentionally working with deep cellular programming from understanding that preconception time. So really inviting the soul back in that intuitive guidance system activated. Everyone that walks away from their nine sessions of meta forget that they had metamorphosis because they are now in alignment. They're just following their intuitive knowing. And I see people Mm. make incredible choices that they were before never thought possible for themselves because they were stuck in patterns that was formed there by before they even knew they were going to be a human. (laughs) Anyway, so there you go. That's amazing. Do you have a favorite client story that helps to kind of just showcase what metamorphosis can do? Hmm. So I had a client that came from deep, deep, deep trauma. Never mind her ancestral and karmic and, and genetic patterns just from the space that she was born into. Um, a lot of tension and the choices that was being made was laid in addiction, relationships that was harming, abusive, um, just consistent patterns showing up. And it was years of practice. And once the completion of of the sessions were done, her self-realization of um, what she was doing and what was happening the cutting of ties of relationships that wasn't serving was so clear where before that was not even considered Um, Mm -hmm. calling in a partner that really saw her and could hold space so that her real healing could start taking place. And it's just beautiful to watch these pieces fall in. And so the transformation there was incredible Mm -hmm. um, to witness. I mean, the privilege of witnessing people just finding their wings is so profound. Absolutely. Often I don't see people again. They fly away. (laughs) I love that. You, you, 
helped to catalyze the healing and then they were ready to fly. They're, they're good to go. <laughs> Amazing. So something I want to better understand is this concept of generational trauma, ancestral trauma, karmic baggage, all of that. So let's say someone listening right now has never heard of any of those terms. How, how can we explain what those are and, and how does that get stored in the body? What is the mechanism through which that's even happening? Yeah. <laughs> Careful to ask me too many scientific questions. <laughs> So we don't have me. to go too deep. <laughs> we can stay up here. I, yeah, no, but yes, for me, it's experiential. So I'm an, I'm an experiential lifer, if we go, you know, living, I always say we're lifing when it gets a little intense, you know, um, and I, and I am a storyteller. So I work with metaphor and I get, I know my daughter, even my little Capricorn brings me down. She's like, mom, say it in seven words already. Um, <laughs> So what does that mean? <laughs> it's it's interesting because I, I love if you read um, The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. Mm. He's the scientist that really breaks it down. So I would recommend that read um, because he, he ta and, and he talks about how the environment our cells form in has such a huge impact on how those cells act out. So when I'm talking about preconception, you're imagining this, this, this idea, this thought, this soul, however you choose to look at it, is deciding to form life. So the sperm and the egg comes together and there's a cell that now is going to create more cells and now a little embryo starts and the human body forms. And, and it's interesting because it's all frequency. It's all vibrational. It's like, it all influences each other continuously. That's why I think I was led into being a doula and working as a birth worker and, mm -hmm. and sitting with parents, um, doing, becoming a birth coach, because I wanted to be part of the pre story where you really set up the mindfulness that we walk with, because it's a frequency. So to clarify more, um, we're water and if you make sound you can see the vibration of the water you can see the ripple you there's so many now new books and and different films out that we can find to explain it better than i could ever try to but just remember everything's a vibration and a frequency that influences the other so when i'm doing mm -hmm. touch therapy or i give my movement workshops where i'm giving you a practice you take home and can do daily or you're working with the hand symbols you're activating a vibration a frequency on a meridian line and even if it's just reminding you of a thought because i've given you the mm -hmm. thought that goes with the hand symbol it's a reminder and that activates a thought activates an emotion that's a vibration emotion is motion it's it it creates a sensation it's an experience now your cells are vibrating differently and that's how we work with this ease and, and we can heal ourselves. The body then, it's, its environment changes. Am I making mm. sense? You are making so much sense. I think that was a beautiful explanation. I loved that. And I, okay. I especially loved what you said about we are water. I mean, if you, if you think about us in the womb, you know, we are surrounded by water. We are still being formed into that more earth element, but we are water. And even now when we're adults, we are like 60 to 70% water. So I love what you said about if you watch water in a glass and there is a sound nearby or the lightest touch, it's going to affect the water. It's actually going to change the cellular structure. I don't know if you've heard of these studies, but they had done these studies, I think in Japan, on the structure of water molecules, where they had two different, uh, two different parts. You might know this, but I'll, I'll explain for the listeners as well. But in oh, one go ahead. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is from what I remember a while ago. In one glass of water, they wrote all of these 
just hateful words on the glass. And it was like, I hate you, you're ugly. And the person writing it had to kind of feel those emotions. And then they looked at another glass where they wrote, I love you, you're beautiful, life is good, whatever. And they actually saw that the molecular structure of the water changed. And the one that was in the glass with the more positive energy, if you will, had a more healing structure and the one with kind of the negative wording like lost its its healing nature. And so that was just one example. I know that's getting away from the body, but just to really bring it down to No, but it's, it's the same. Us. Yes. Absolutely. I love that. And one other piece that I I really appreciate that you talked about is where you said that emotions are just motion. I've heard it's energy in motion. And I feel like that even brings us back full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning about intuition and tuning in. That if you can notice your emotion and you understand that your emotion is just the energy in motion trying to clue you into something, it it gives you that sense of knowing. You suddenly understand. So anyway, I think it sounds wonderful and I would love to experience a session at some point in the future. <laughs> it sounds I would really... love to offer one to you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so kind of shifting gears a little bit because I could talk about that forever, but there's a couple other topics I really want to touch on with you. So one of them is pin codes, which that was also the first time I'd heard of it when I was with you. I've obviously heard of things similar like numerology, but can you tell us a little bit about pin codes and and how that came into your journey and, and why you think it's so powerful? Absolutely. Oh, it's so fun. It's just such a fun game. Oh, my God. So I'll show you. <laughs> this is the, it's a book by Douglas Forbes. Okay. It's really, okay, can you see? So it's the human pin code, the sacred maths in your birth date. Douglas Forbes, he's a South African man. And I found this because I was starting to um, do quite a bit of uh, journey work with this uh, local shaman that I learned so much from Lionel Berman in South Africa uh, early in my 20s because, like I said, I was really going, I was in a deep part of the river. I really had to find all the tools to keep me buoyant mm. and my head up. So I learned metamorphosis. Mm. I found Lionel and he taught me so many of my ceremonial uh, guidance that came through through my guide workshops and um, channelings with him mm. he's also the man who married me and Ryan and uh, wow. I found Diedrich who taught me kinesiology and I found uh, human cost constellations I did lots of different uh, modalities came over my path and then the human pen code oh my gosh where who told me about it was it my godmother I think so I read the book and we started playing with it as a family and then as friends. And it just, every time I work with it and I sit with it, it's, I learn something new and it gives me such insight and a point of departure mm -hmm. and a point to connect with, with people that um, drops me into a unconditional space. So I think it's important for me to create unconditional space where people can really just be mm. because then they show up as their best selves because I'm not sitting there wanting them to be anything specific for me and then we're all more authentic mm. and voila so his method he blends he found many different modalities that he worked with the elements he works with numerology and some others um, and he just said nothing is quite full enough and simple enough he wanted to make it simple and i love simplicity might not always sound like that with my words but i love simplicity <laughs> and so you just yeah. take the birth date and he made a pyramid and each number has an element and it's zero to nine and there is um your social your, your personality your social consciousness your global consciousness your life cycle your lesson 
there's a space where you're you're introduced to a quality of your inner self and your inner child and then finally a sense of spirit that you move with in the world so once you get a person's full picture Mm -hmm. it's not who they are absolutely but it gives you a sense of them and why they might react or respond in certain things just or to certain people or circumstances so do you want to hear about yours absolutely (laughs) I I do before you get into that though something that I that that just made me think of is it is so similar in some ways to astrology which I know we talked about when I was with you for the cacao ceremony and what I love about both of these modalities is that as you said it allows you to have unconditional love for someone being exactly who they are and recognizing that that is part of their sacred life path and they are that way for a reason it's all divinely constructed and it makes us feel the same way about ourselves too that you can look at an astrology chart or your human pin codes and say this was all meant to be like I am here for a divine reason and I am a masterpiece So I really love these modalities. And the answer is yes, I would love to hear mine, please. (laughs) (laughs) It truly is fun. And I was fascinated by yours and and, and your path and what you're busy with and your way with words and with people and even the way your friends spoke about you. I was like, of course, this is makes so much sense and (laughs) we share the personality type of a nine you know and that is the child so you're the 18th you're the 18th of august Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. um the 18 so we only work up to nine right so you're the number nine one and eight makes nine and the number nine has no elements or you can see it as all the elements and it's the child it's the one that that will always figure out how everything's working and how we can play in that so it's in a very observant number it's a very if we transmute we kind of play with what is and our biggest challenge Mm -hmm. is to um, remember ourselves because we are so fascinated and then we start morphing in order to feel what that feels like maybe or to keep us safe or depending on your circumstances. So it's a wonder, it's a, it's, it's the number that holds all the numbers. It's when you put another number next to nine, it, it's that number. So think about that just as a I metaphor. That. Yes. It right? also makes sense that so, we are both these multi-passionate people that we both like to wear a lot of hats like you've mentioned yours I mean metamorphosis pin codes doula life coaching and for myself too like astrology breathwork facilitation I mean coaching as well all of that and I think that points to being the child that is insatiably curious they're trying to learn about the world they're trying to kind of piece things together they're observing things about other people and the way things are they're kind of it sounds like they're just fascinated by the nature of the universe the nature of humanity um and if that is true i definitely resonate oh yes the nine i i i think you're so right well said beautiful because we i feel also that the nine in these in the context that you and i work in it's it's diving into understanding the pain of the world and how to transmute it because come on people this is a playground we've got to keep it fun (laughs) so anyway (laughs) um yes with that aspect of play that's something that I really admire and resonate with you on because I know you're always talking about making it fun, like not forgetting to play, not forgetting to laugh, to make things light. And I am constantly telling people that. Um, I know, you know, on my Instagram stories, my most common theme is don't forget to play. And it's always videos of me dancing like a wild woman, not even caring what I look like, but just reminding people to enjoy life. I love you for that. I love you for that. (laughs) My acronym for fun and play, 
that I want to spread is this. Play. Productive, loving action your way. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Snaps for that. That's so beautifully okay. said. And so here's the other part of it for me, because people misunderstand when I say play and fun and they go, well, when I'm in the deep darkness of my pain, I don't feel like it's fun and I want to play. So forgive me if I am not there with you. And I want to say to them, yes. And so let's not push your buttons and hear me when I say that. If you're in the mud and it's just cold and dreary and awful, just having a moment to look up and say to yourself, okay, this is a very intense moment in time. It's really hard to keep my head above the water. I do feel like I'm drowning. The moment you look up, you, you become, you float easier. And when I say pr productive, loving action your way, playing softly, gently then in order to function unconditionally in the present, in the now. So then that's fun in a different context because mm. the soul is always having a, a, a uh, perspective of like, ooh, that's interesting. And I love you so much for having the courage and the bravery for even allowing yourself to feel all these feelings. This is intense. And the soul never goes into why me? It goes, mm. this is amazing that you get to do this. And I mm. applaud you and I'm here, I'm holding and we'll get through this. So for those people that's really sitting in the depths of despair and I, I sit there with you, I do. I, mm. I mean, even this morning, I was standing in the ocean and I'm going, okay, so there's this new sense of heavy and, and um, disorientation that I'm sitting with and I'm learning what self-compassion really means. And wow, it's, it's something. So, you know, I just want to hold space for, for everyone that is sitting on the other side of the coin because every coin is mm -hmm. both sides. Yes. Ooh. Well said. Okay. What's next for the pin codes? So I want to say you have eight, nine, eight and sevens is strong for you. And the eighth is the mm. dependable one. And the seven is the truth seeker. It's the idealist. So your entire pin code speaks into what my favorite, I see myself that way as a practical idealist. And so I think that's where we really play in the same field, like the same field of flowers. We found each other because we are not going to look away from the truth. It's not that we're saying everything is sunshine and roses. We're mm -hmm. saying there's a way to transmute and work with what is. And that is the eighth is, is a manifesto. And that's in your social and global consciousness. Hmm. Because it's fun. You're 1997. I'm 1979. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah. Isn't that fun? And your lesson lies in the fact that you can read between the lines. You're a truth seeker. Um, what lies beneath your iceberg that many people don't see is... Um, it's the same as where your inner child comes from. Like there's a lot going on below the surface that you are computing when you look at the world. And I think that's yeah. a part of why you might be working in the modalities that you work in is, is this sense of how do we soothe? How do we heal? How do we make it feel better for everyone so we can all, you know, just play nicer really so the truth seeker is yeah. never going to look away from the harsh truths she's going to call it out and so your mm -hmm. inner child sits right next to your inner self who's an eight so the dependable striving manifestor you is there next to the one that's going mm -hmm. but wait a minute this is not okay like there's a different way mm -hmm. here people you know and <laughs> the idealist the one that's a creative 
is mm. super into reading people and wanting to make everyone feel good. What's beautiful is that your fire comes from your sense of spirit, which is a six, which mm. is one of my favorite numbers. It's the number of charisma, of the love, of things should be beautiful. And, you know, you care how you present, not just what you dress or, or look like, but in essence, how you present, how you make others feel. Um, it matters to you in a relationship. You care a lot about the room that you are in and how that feels for you and everybody. It's a number that mm. has consideration and it's the lover, you know, and that's your mm. sense of spirit. So when there's lots going on for you, that's that's the part of you that steers you through all the rapids and yes. crazy. It's very true. And it's it's so interesting, even what you said about the practical idealist. I really, really love that because I am absolutely an idealist. People have kind of referred to me as sunshine and human form my whole life. I do have kind of that that joyful vibrance of like, we get to be here and it gets to be fun. But I think what I'm really stepping into in this current era phase of my life is learning how to use that as my gift while also saying there is a dark side and without the dark side we wouldn't have the light and even what you were saying a moment ago that just this morning you had this moment of heavy grief standing in the ocean that we can experience that as human beings and have that light playfulness I think I'm just getting more comfortable with blending the two and um, making sure that for people that are in that dark place, I don't come off as too, life is good all the time <laughs> because life can be good even when it's hard is what I'm trying to say. And I, I don't think in the past it always came off that way. So I really appreciate that. I'm I'm going to take that and run. The practical idealist. I love that. So thank you for sharing the pin codes. I mean, that's a really cool, just a really cool modality. And the fact that it relates to the elements as well. I mean, I'm personally fascinated by the elements. I've been studying them deeply in astrology recently. And I wanted to ask you, just kind of on a personal note, which of the four elements do you resonate most deeply with or maybe two of the four because I have thoughts for you but I wanted to ask you oh I want to hear your thoughts um mm -hmm. for me current so I start with one and then I want to go oh and that one and that one and that one <laughs> so all four mm -hmm. no I <laughs> yes. um hmm. so <laughs> here's here's what I'll say I was known because I'm a Gemini I was known as an airhead, right? So very airy, very sort of um, you, like in my imagination, like I said, a lonely child that people were a little bit mm, confused by. And then as I've grown, the earth, the earth element, because I'm a feeler, I live in my body. I feel everything as a sensation that I've learned to translate and understand in my body um, as I've as I've studied and learned and experienced. But recently, it's fire and water. So I'm, I'm Aries rising. So i am really got a lot of fire coming through as there's a lot of transmutation happening. And I'm very aware of my, this lioness energy coming through. Um, like you said, there's a mother, mother of ocean. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's something that has been presencing itself in my life uh, that is becoming affirmed. And that, sh that part of me carries a lot of fire. I get my information when I sit by the river and sit by the ocean. So the water brings me to earth where I then can receive whatever I am needed to talk about or speak into for myself or for others. Mm -hmm. I All love that. that. It's, it's also interesting how your connection with the elements can shift over time because 
I've even found in my own personal astrology studies recently that you can have a certain kind of elementary makeup in your birth chart, but it doesn't always refer to what you're experiencing in your life because we can kind of call upon the elements at different times throughout our journey. So for you, what I was imagining, especially in the beginning with your story, I was seeing a lot of earth and fire because the earth to me was this connection to the body and this connection to literally mother nature, that you were that young girl running barefoot through the trees and wanting to be a, a ranger exploring the, the wildness of Africa. That felt very earth to me, but the fire is that playfulness, that, uh, that spark of inspiration and uh, travel, adventure, all of that is very, very fire to me. But it's it's interesting. I can see the air. I mean, as the storyteller, as the woman wearing, wearing many hats, and I also really resonate with that fire and air together because I'm a Leo, fire sign sun, and then a Gemini rising. And so even when you had told me the Gemini and the Aries rising at the cacao ceremony, I thought, aha, no wonder I love this woman. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's fun making some of those connections but for people that are listening that want to hear their own human pin codes is there a website that they can go to how can they learn more about their own i mean there it's it's interesting um this this is the one book that he wrote that sums it up okay. this human pin okay. code by douglas forbes and okay. you can look him up he does have um Honestly, the book, getting the book is ideal. Um, and going to his website, I, it's not, it's kind of like metamorphosis. It's interesting. It hasn't quite hit the, it's, it's because it's, I think it's the simplicity of it. I think it's because it's South Africa. It's on the far Southern tip of the world. Who knows? Hmm. Here I am sharing it. If you if you're really intrigued, I'm happy to, um, you know, share my. You can you can email me. I am happy with that, and we can play. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Because I could see this really sparking someone's curiosity, and then being like, "Where do I go from here?" But the book is definitely on my to read sure. list at this point. <laughs> So transitioning to kind of our last topic, one that I'm very, very excited to get your take on. I want to talk a little bit about psychedelics because in my audience, Ooh, yeah. we have some people who might be aware of some of the studies around psychedelics. They might be completely open to the concept of it. And then other people are still in the camp of psychedelics or drugs that are being popularized these days, and I don't know why. So can you kind of walk us through, because I know there's, even at Sunset Park Provisions, where you, you know, provide all these services, there were a lot of mushroom books and information about psychedelics and services using microdosing. So can you kind of just step back for a second and explain for people that are not that familiar with the healing aspect of it yet. How do you like to explain your perspective of what psychedelics are and, and what they can provide for us? Whew. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, wavy topic right now, isn't it? Um, yes. Here's what I can do. I can share my story. I'm by no Perfect. means an expert. I am learning with everybody as we speak. And I, I always only speak from experience. I think experience is our expertise. Um, you know, I've read some books. Uh, Michael Pollan's book is a wonderful read because he dives in and goes, shares his experience and his journey and conversations with people. I think that's a very valuable read because he doesn't go, it's great, it's not great. He just says, here's what I've learned. And I so appreciate that. Yeah, I'm actually, it's on my bedside table. Michael Pollan, how to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I was the good kid. 
<laughs> I never did anything. <laughs> I was the one that my my sense went if I'm not standing on the ground where it's grown or I don't see the hands that made it, I am going to steer clear because there's it, there's so much attached to these things. And I think maybe early on I was aware of my own sensitivity. So I come from a pretty conservative place. Let me put, let me start there. And as my journey into stepping more into what I am personifying now as someone that really wants to slow the world down and um, in an intentional way where we're paying attention to the part we're playing, it's honoring the earth we walk upon, every plant, every animal, every rock, every piece of soil is living and alive and we benefit from paying attention to it. So coming from that place, um, kind of revisiting my childhood self, I think it's also the age that I'm in. It's like a natural part of life for me and for everybody. Um, so see, it's not a crisis. It's a rebirth, people. The 40s. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I started this journey. I found an incredible coach, Himalaya. I My journey took me to Costa Rica. And that was one of my first experiences with psilocybin. Mm. And I was in ceremony. I was in relationship with the land. I understood the medicine. I'd done education on it. I was taught about what would possibly be um, gifted to me in this space that we were occupying, having consumed it, and the setting, the land and the safety of the container that we were in. And so that was incredible. It brought to my attention that these mushrooms, the psilocybin that is coming through these specific mushrooms, are my allies as a human because they are re recalibrating our cell memory. They are healers. They are. Um, they work with our intentions. So, uh, from my experience. It doesn't alter states of mind without you being willing to. Now, that's my experience. That's how I see it. That's the message I've received. Quote me on it, not. Michael Pollan speaks into it also, though. So in retrospect, now after I've had my experiences reading his book, I'm like, amazing. Yes, it mm -hmm. is so much about set and setting and your intention on how you're going to work mm -hmm. with this. We come from people using psychedelics in, in settings of concerts and parties and festivals. And that is going to be a completely different set of circumstances, um, mm -hmm. has its own benefits and problematic pieces. Mm -hmm. I don't have that experience. I cannot speak into it. Mm -hmm. So when Natasha, my partner at provisions came, um, into my life, and we mostly work with the adaptogenic. So when I came to Santa Monica, I went to the farmer's market and there was lion's mane and there were these incredibly gorgeous beings, these mushrooms. I fell in love. I was just so drawn to them. And I cooked this lion's mane for my daughters like fish. And my Laura does not like mushrooms. She loved it. And I personally am a huge lover of lion's mane specifically retrospect i listened to this podcast and i learned lion's mane is so good for women my age mm -hmm. that's going through maybe a, a little bit of perimenopause that mm -hmm. is going through this kind of transformational space physically hormonally lion's mane is our ally see how we're drawn to what we need what we need i think mushrooms mm -hmm. will come into your life when you need it if you don't need it you know it's a, it's totally your call it's not for everybody and I think they're here to trans um, mute all this cell programming that has caused such disease and addiction and anxiety. It really, there's so many studies there. It's all there for us to tap into, but it's personal to every person. I'm checking in with myself if I'm answering your question. If I'm just yes. going on a tangent. 
No, you you definitely are. And I agree with you. I mean, going back to what we said at the beginning, storytelling is the most the most transformational answer you can give. So by telling your personal story, I think people listening will be able to better connect with that. And for me too, I resonate so deeply with what you're saying because just like you, I've always been kind of the good girl. I mean, I don't drink. I don't really party unless it's dancing with my girlfriends, drinking cacao. I, I've always been kind of on my own path. And anything that didn't feel aligned, I was the first to say no. Peer pressure wasn't really a thing for me. I kind of just, I heard the beat of my own drum and I followed it. And I say that also to preface that my experience, I've only had a few experiences with psilocybin mushrooms so far, but they have been beautiful. I actually had this experience about a year ago with my husband where we went to a microdosed breathwork experience. So it was, you know, about an hour or an hour and a half of really activating intense emotional breathwork aided by a little bit of microdosed tea. And it was so powerful because I've done a lot of breathwork, but my husband hadn't and he's tried mushrooms more than I have. And so it was almost like us sharing our modalities and blending them together. And we both had such a transformational experience. I mean, relying on the yoga studio floor, crying, kind of healing this stress and trauma that's been stored in our body. And then afterwards, we went to dinner and we read our journal entries to each other. And we just cried and held each other for like an hour. And it was so beautiful. I have no other words than it was exactly what we both needed it to be. And I think when you use these medicines with intentionality, and as you said, you have the right set and setting, it does tend to bring you exactly what you need. It's not always what you want, but it's exactly what you need. It's so true. It's not, it's like that intention sets you up, but you cannot go in with an expectation in any relationship, whether it's with a plant or a mushroom or a person and make them mm-hmm. act a certain way to meet your intent. Your uh, setting an intention means I am going in this way. I'm clear on mm-hmm. what I am coming in with, what thoughts I have activated, what I have eaten, what I have not eaten what I am willing to be, you know, what am I bringing into the space? That's intention. And then I think what they do is they, they, they honor that. So the moment you don't feel very safe in a setting, it's almost like they shut down. I've had experiences where if you're, where I see people not having any effect by a high dose of psilocybin going, I don't feel anything. Mm. I don't feel a thing. And I think that's, because it wasn't going to serve. And that's why I respect mm-hmm. the medicine because I, I really, um, it's not an, it's not an uh, addictive thing. It's not, it's only, um, it's, I love that you went on that journey with your husband. It's so whatever it is that you want it to be. So mm. I really, I never got this message. So I went into it expecting quite a thing because people had built up this whole psychedelic thing that it's you know you're it's mind altering and you're going to fall over your feet or you're not going to be in this world I was a little bit like oof, this is I don't know you know and it's nothing like that Mm -hmm. (laughs) you see I I mean it just deepened my relationship with what I knew to be true and it showed me what's not true So what I didn't like, I mean, what you said about not, it's not always what you want. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But it's always going to show you what is good for you. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up the, the fact that it doesn't have to be some hugely mind altering, almost like scary, big experience. The experiences I've had so far have been very gentle. And it's probably been because 
I wasn't necessarily ready for some huge experience. Whereas my husband is a little bit uh, more fearless <laughs> with, you know, trying different amounts of these medicines. He still does it very safely and intentionally. Um, and he likes to meditate doing it and things like that. So he's he does it very um, respectfully. But I think because when I've had these experiences, I wasn't in a place of, I want to be out of my mind. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. Thank goodness. It was yeah. very gentle and loving. Yeah. And I think the mushrooms are that. They are. They work gently. And for me, it's all about the integrity of how we work with this medicine. So I want to preface that piece of when um, we do stuff like microdosing or offer any of that kind of thing, it's very much... Um, holding the integrity of it and the set and setting and how we work with who comes in is very on invitation, very working um, with high integrity because it's, it is controversial. It's, it's different wherever you go. Some places it's legal, some places it's not. So we're, you know, um, we want to respect everyone's feelings around it to make it, not become something that's such a way that people just kick back because I think it's here for a reason. Mm -hmm. I really think mm -hmm. it's, it's coming up now for a very good reason. Yeah, I agree. Reminding us that we're not alone. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I think for anyone who's listening, who maybe at this point is intrigued, but still a little bit cautious, a little nervous about it, I highly recommend checking out the website MAPS. They do a lot of research studies around psychedelic-assisted therapy, and they found just through their research that psychedelic experiences statistically tend to be the quote unquote, most spiritual liberating experience of people's lifetimes. That's what a lot of people say. And it has been shown to help with PTSD, severe anxiety, chronic depression, bipolar disorder. I mean, it's, as we've been saying now for a while, when done right, it can be liberating and healing. Yeah, that's really the only way I've ever seen and experienced it. And I, and. And everyone that I've talked to, it's it's a beautiful journey. It allows you to it, what it allows you to see and experience is it's beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, amen. So before we move on to our final kind of rapid fire questions, I wanted to ask if there's anything else that I left out that's on your heart, on your mind right now that you'd like to share. I, I want to say, I want to say this. If you are here, then you belong here. And then you will have what you need. And in that statement, I mean that there is enough and that you are enough. So beautifully said. Wow. Thank you. That was the perfect note to transition into our rapid fire questions. So for these final questions, there are four. The first one is always personalized for the guest and then the last three stay the same. So the first question for you is of all of the places that you have traveled to or lived in, which was your favorite? <laughs> I'm in one right now. I'm in Santa Monica, California, and I, I feel like it's one of my favorite places I've ever lived. Mm. Okay. I love that. So for people who haven't checked it out, it's time to check it out. <laughs> and question number two is what spiritual or health practice do you do that you would recommend for everyone? It is just that amazing. Well, my first thing in my head was dance just go wild and shake and dance and with that said I my practice that I do in body metamorphosis brings me back into alignment every single time amazing amen to dance any form of moving your body feels great and it's good for you <laughs> 
I love that. So number I have one more. three. I have one more. Can mm-hmm. I? Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just realized it's really important. I think people forget this. Put your bare feet on the ground on Mother Earth. Put your bare feet on soil or grass or sand daily. Mm. Well said. I love that. Okay. Number three. What does this world need most these days for global healing and up-leveling? To remember that there is enough. Yeah. It's a, it's a big statement and it's a small and simple statement. I know, but it is mm-hmm. for me the key to our well-being. Yes. Okay, let's roll with it. I love that. And final question is, what is your one wish or ask for everyone listening to this? My wish for you is to tune into your soul, to put your soul in the steering, by the steering wheel and trust it. So I'm saying tune in to you. You know what's best for you. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you for being here, Quinn. I have gotten so much out of this conversation. I could talk to you for hours and hours more. I feel like we just skimmed the surface, but you are truly so wise and you are bringing pure magic to this world. So thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you for being all the magic and for seeing and (laughs) believing so much love. Yes, of course. Of course. So for anyone listening that wants to get in touch with you or see what you do, where can they find you? Uh, So, excuse me. So you can find me on my website is quinbrownhuffman.com and really Sunset Park Provisions. And that's on Instagram and mm. on Instagram, I have a active page called Sharai Veti, keep moving. That has been my motto throughout life. And that's mm. where I share my poetry and where I'm most active because that's when I play. Um, but sunsetparkprovisions.com or quinbrownhuffman.com. Amazing. And I will link everything in the description so people can find you. But Thank you again. And for everyone listening, we will see you next week. Hey, my friends, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. As I said at the beginning, Quinn is truly this multi-passionate, multi-faceted healer woman. She embodies the mother archetype, the friend, the daughter, the healer, the medicine woman, and the child. She's fun, light, and playful. She is here to remind us to enjoy the small things and to make light of even the most challenging times, finding that sunshine even on our dark days. So I hope that you found some of these nuggets of wisdom really inspiring and motivating for your personal path. Maybe at this point you want to take a deeper dive into metamorphosis or human pin codes or even psychedelics. Maybe her story and her journey fascinated you and you're starting to feel the call of hopping on a plane with a one-way plane ticket in hand, following the calls of your soul and your spirit. No matter what resonated with you, I hope there was at least one takeaway for you. I know I had many, many takeaways. So if you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with a family member or friend. It really helps this podcast to grow and as this podcast grows, it allows me to keep doing what I love and sharing these people and these insights with you. I already cannot wait to see you again next week and until then my friends, bye for now. Bye.